Exploring a world requires more than a sword or a bow. Those who venture across its surface to admire the view and meet the strange creatures inhabiting it are travellers. What they see, what they see for themselves, they're not explorers. For that lofty title, one must do more than see, one must record, pursue, and most importantly, understand. For a world builder, it can be tempting to allow your story to stop the traveller's comprehension, to use their assumptions and understandings to fill in the gaps before you move on. But if you want to do more than tread water when filling your world, it's not as daunting a task as it may seem. Welcome, adventurers, to another Red Quills map making and world building tutorial. My name is Ryan of the Red Quills, and I will be your guide today as we discuss creating one of the most striking kinds of map the drawing of a naturalist's map. In this video, I'll go over the processes for drawing the map, creating the flora and fauna, sketching those organisms, writing compelling notes, and bringing them all together into one foxy illustration. This tutorial is a part of this week's topic, which is how to draw a naturalist map. We'll be going through the step-by-step -step of the map today, but if you want more information on the world building specifics, you can check out the short series releasing this week on our channel. There's also a written journal post containing the information written down if you prefer, and that'll release on Sunday. I'll put the link to my journal in the description below. We've gone over some variations on the common kind of map in tutorials leading up to this. While I spent most of February going over different kinds of maps of the realm, maps showing the different maneuvers and boundaries in war, maps showing trade routes and economic information, maps that delve into magic and history, I have more recently been exploring more site-specific maps illustrated maps, stylized city maps, and last week we discussed building plans and blueprints for our heist maps topic. But this week we're going to whole new heights. Normally, I attempt to show you how you can create a map even when you have little to no experience or skill in illustrating. The process is quite simple, if laborious, and it is much more important to be deliberate than flowery. This video, however, does require some art skills. I'll go into the processes that I've used, and I'm sure that anyone, regardless of experience or what people insist is an inbuilt artistic talent, can do what I have done if they practice and apply themselves. I've also started receiving comments asking why I bother with these maps, as they're too time consuming to warrant making for an RPG, to which I say, Boulder Dash. I mean, this map, which is of the Drifting Isles, is a gift for my partner. It's a location of significance in the world that she and our friends are exploring in the Dungeons & Dragons game that I run. I will be using this in-game. It's a lot of time and effort, but it is very much worth the time and effort you put into it, and I find the drawing of it to be quite relaxing. So if you don't understand the purpose of that, if you think it's too much effort for your own world, then that's absolutely fine. You can just continue to watch me doing these things. But I would recommend adding that extra layer of immersion and world building to your own games and your own fantasy worlds. But I'm getting off track. Let's start at the beginning with a blank sheet of paper. As always, I'm using a sheet of blank A2 paper. Now we're gonna be using watercolors to create our illustrations, so we need a thicker sheet of paper than one that I normally use. This paper is 240 GSM, so quite thick. And while I can't because of my filming setup, I would recommend that you tape yours down so that the paper doesn't buckle with the moisture. I start with a sketch. In this case, as you can see, what I've done is divide my piece of paper into roughly the golden ratio. Artists love that for some reason. And I've used that ratio to determine the different sections of my map, as this is a map of the Drifting Isle. I'll need an overview map, which will be the largest section of the page, a side view of the Isle, which will be the next in size, a great deal of explanatory text in the blank areas, and I've created seven circles into which I'll paint the flora and fauna of the aisle. So I'm going to start this map off by watercoloring on the page. I've got seven circles of flora and fauna to do and then I'll paint the surface of the water blue on the overhead and side views of the aisle because we're committing to this aesthetic. Now quite apart from the practicalities of how to paint in watercolor, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment, there's a couple of things to remember about using watercolors in mixed media like this map. Firstly, if you have a pencil sketch underneath your watercolor, it can become difficult to erase the pencil after painting. This may seem obvious to some, but it's worth noting. I'll be tidying up the pencil lines later, but the lines visible under the paint will remain there. There are ways to remove pencil from under watercolors, but it is a general rule. Just make it easy on yourself. Secondly, 
I'm using a Unipen fine liner for this work today, which is a solid pen to use and I would recommend them, the full equipment list is in the description. But if you're using any kind of pen with watercolour, make sure that the ink is not water soluble, otherwise it will blend with the watercolour. You could also just wait for the paint to dry before adding the ink. Now what I've done here is penciled a quick sketch. I formed a complete image of what I want to paint in my mind before putting pencil to paper. I've used simple shapes to block it on the page and then added important texture details briefly. Then I've mostly erased it so that I won't need to erase later from under the watercolors, but there's still enough of an impression on the page that I can use it as a guide. I prepped the paper by painting it with a light layer of water to help me blend the watercolors, and then I start adding some colors. First water, then colors. Watercolors, very easy to remember. Now it's worth noting here that I'm not exactly a watercolor painter myself. Anyone who watches these videos knows that I work in ink and pencil a lot. And on an unrelated note, I'm a fair oil painter. but. Watercolors is something I'm still working on myself, and I say this not to play down what the final product is going to look like, but to encourage you to try it yourself. There's no such thing as a person that can't create art. That being said, I do try to learn as I'm doing, and I've done a bit of experimenting in these paintings to teach myself. Mostly, it worked great, but that last illustration, which is of the fire spitter, a kind of land-based coral, is a little bit um, derpy. In watercolors, you start by adding the lighter colors first and then working darker and darker. You can see that that's what I'm doing through all of these illustrations. Pencil sketch first, light layers of watercolor, add more detail with the darker colors, and then we'll finally use a fine liner at the end to give it some definition. Because I want the paint to dry before I ink it, I'll paint all of them, do some other work, and then come back to ink it. It's worth noting here that uh, if you're doing this map for yourself, the watercoloring, for me, took by far the longest amount of time. I'm very quick with ink and pen now. It's the, the detailing on all of my maps that takes the most amount of time. In this case, and in any of the maps that I generally try to make, I, I cap myself at about eight hours to make the map itself. And for this map, it took me roughly, I think, four hours to do the watercolor painting. I've sped that up, obviously, this video isn't four hours long, but when you do it for yourself, take the time. Um, allow it to dry, be patient with it. The best result you're going to get is going to be the outcome of patience and not of rush. So now we've gone over the process of sketching them. I'll talk a little bit about how I sit down and come up with the ideas of the creatures that I've added in so that you can use those concepts in your own world as well. I mean, that's the purpose of these kinds of maps. After all, they're supposed to give inspiration, insights, interest to a completely different place and perspective. And while I'm sketching these out in the watercolors, it's a great time to talk about the Drifting Isle and its flora and fauna. When you create a world of your own, you will create it with a genre. Now, you may not mean to, you may not be aware of it, but everyone's created worlds reflect in some way their creator. So if you're writing a high fantasy world where everyone has good in them somewhere and there's one source of evil that corrupts the world, then that's gonna inform what it's like to live on the ground there. Similarly, if you explore a, a mist-filled pocket dimension where people who die always awaken the following morning with no memory of their deaths and strange wraiths reach out of the darkness to claim you, then that's going to have very different flora and fauna. So ask yourself, what's the genre of your world? If you hate answering questions like that because of an ingrained response to high school, just, just ask yourself what book or film series it's most like. I mean, for instance, The Drifting Isle here is the body of an ancient eldritch creature perpetually floating through the high seas in a bank of fog. It has a Lovecraftian vibe to it, and I'm going for a surrealist horror kind of genre. So, once you've got your genre, that can help you figure out what kind of base organisms you've got going on. For this map, I tried to make a fairly wide variety of creatures. So I have a tree, a bush, a grass, a fungus, a seaweed, a coral, and a bird. Not a large number of fauna, it has to be said, but that's just because of the nature of the isle. 
Jot down a list of the kinds of flora and fauna you want to explore and don't crowd it with too many of the one type. So a basic list that you can add into your naturalist map is a tree, a bush or a shrub, a bird, a small mammal, an insect, arachnid or a mollusk, and a fungus. Now you can use the genre of your world to help you identify a real world example of this creature in a setting that you want to emulate. If you're in an untamed low fantasy world, your tree can be a redwood. If you're out in a horrifying magical wilderness, your fungus can be a devil's tooth mushroom. You've got your base organism, so now you can make it your own. There's a rule in improv acting summed up with the phrase, yes and. The idea is that when you're making something up on the fly with a group of people, you should never shut down an idea. You should take that idea and add to it. It's a good rule to have in many creative endeavors, and it's one that I recommend for this one too. When you've chosen a base for one of your flora or fauna, you can then take that base and make it your own by adding on a new characteristic or exaggerating one of its existing characteristics in response to the genre of your world. For instance, let's take one of the flora I've made for the Drifting Isle here, the Reachers. They're a kind of fungus, a capped mushroom that springs up on the drier surfaces of the isle. There are a great many strange and gruesome mushrooms in this world, and many of them look like creatures or organs themselves. So I dug deeper into the Lovecraftian genre of my setting and made them look like hands with sharp blood red nails. There are already a huge number of mushrooms that look like body parts. I won't waste anyone's time by listing them, but it's frankly horrifying. I've just pushed that aesthetic past a similarity to a body part, in this case, a human hand, and into looking exactly like a human hand. I've yes anded the mushroom. So you've chosen a base organism, you've added on one or more characteristics to make it more suitable for your world, more strange and imagination sparking than before. Now you can create some context for it. It already exists in your world. There may be an origin story for it, a, a use for it in the culinary or artisanal arenas, or some folk tales about it. Your naturalist's map is the perfect place to add that in. Not too much, just enough to spark the imagination. Later in this video, I'll go into the actual note-taking process and what I've done there. But in this case, I'll just read what this map says about the reaches. Figure 3. Reaches. Extremely dangerous. The crew is wary of the hand funguses, these reaches. One of their number thought it was funny, when we first landed, to shake hands with one. He died yesterday, covered in hand-like protrusions and bloodied fingernails. Add in a first-hand <laughs> account of an interaction around the organism in question to give it more depth and realism when you're creating the naturalist map. While we're here, I'm going to talk quickly about the three kinds of sketch that I have in this map and why your naturalist's map, or really any map that delves into one specific natural location in depth, should have these three. Obviously, in this case, my map is focused on the natural habitat created on this strange, weird island. But in my other site-specific maps, of which I have another coming out next week, they still have all three in one form or another. And remember, no one's going to get anywhere by putting down their own skills. You are capable of doing everything that I'm doing here. Take the time, think it through, and keep going until you're finished. If you don't like the final result, that's actually a good thing. It means you have an idea of what you want to focus on in your next map. Every map, and I'm not honestly entirely sure why I have to say this other than for completeness, every map must contain a map. Does that scan? Every map must have a map, not a sketch, not an illustration map, an easy to read graphical representation of the terrain and its landmarks. A map must be to a consistent scale. It must contain accurate information. It must be usable for the people on the ground. If your map does not contain a map, then it's not a map. It's an illustration. Now I know that maps can be impassive, unemotional, and aesthetic things. and I <laughs> I don't mean that, I love maps. But I know that other people can think that. So if your top-down map does not scratch the itch that you have for a more stylized aesthetic representation of your world, then consider adding in a ground level view. Now, not only is this illustration more aesthetic, it's also useful. Remember that 
the purpose of a map is to help you when you get lost. An accurate ground level view is actually useful in helping a person to find the location as long as you mark where the sketch location is. The last is the individual sketches. In this case, they're the watercolor paintings of the flora and fauna. In other maps, I've done coin-sized illustrations of landmarks or views, there to give the reader the impression of what it's like on the ground. You can sketch organisms, views, peoples, coins, sigils, flags, anything else that you desire. The sketches are your chance to really focus on what the people will be seeing as they move around your world. We can see now that the basic shape of the map is coming together. Like a lot of my site-specific maps, I've left a great deal of blank space between my illustrations and in the bottom right-hand corner, which is where you can see I've made the nice little uh, watercolored title so that I can add in the notes later on. Notes are a crucial part of a naturalist's sketches and I really wanted to make this map feel like a genuine explorer's journaling. I've used a couple of techniques in this map to try to make it presentable and come together towards the end. It's worth noting that while I'm very happy with the end result, there are a few things that I will change when I do the next iteration of it. It's the same with any artwork, I think. There's no such thing as a perfect piece. But here are some basic rules to remember as you're making your own maps and world building sketches. If you're looking at your work and thinking it's missing something or something's not working, look at these three points. Whatever you do, you must be consistent when you're doing them. That is to say, commit to the work. In this piece, I've gone for a much more chaotic style. The drifting aisle is a focus of weirdness and a kind of organic horror. So it follows that a map of the site will have some of that chaos bleed through. It does mean that I need to strike a balance between mess and readability though. But for your work, be consistent. If you choose to go for an orderly look, commit to it. Rule out your guidelines or your grids. Make sure that your distancing is meticulous. If you choose to use a medium or a style in one area, make sure that you apply that rule consistently. For instance, I watercolored the title here on the map. I think that this map could be improved if I painted the titles for the overhead view and the side view as well. But I didn't think of that until after. Think of the balance of your piece as the ability for the eye to break it down and digest it. Often in the real world, maps are made without much thought to how easily they could be digested. The cartographers in question simply take out a pre-assigned area and sketch it out as accurately as they can. But if you're making one from scratch, you have the opportunity to make things easier and more aesthetic for the viewer. The balance in this case exists in the detail, color, and composition of the image versus writing. Creating a balance between the three of them will draw more attention to your work. What is the content of your map? Simply put, is it worth the time and effort you've put into it? I mean, generally speaking, the answer is always. Any map is a good map if you can read it and learn from it. But if you look at your map and think that it needs something more, then it probably does need something more. You want your maps to tell a story. It may be a boring story, one about mountains and rivers and cities, but that's the kind of story that a map is suited to tell. If it seems blank and bland, try adding in some of the illustrations or the notes that we've discussed. All right, last point here, the writing of the notes in the margins. It's a staple of Explorer's map, and it can really elevate the world building that you're working with. I'd recommend adding in some scrawled notes to any of your maps for your fantasy world. Unless your protagonists have gotten themselves a brand new crystal clean map straight off the printer or out of the illustrator's office, what's to stop it from having the scribbles of its previous owner to explain to the reader some of the nuance of your world? So there are really two kinds of notes that you can find on maps, official and unofficial. Official notes will concern things like details that the map is too crowded to convey, or clearing up potential misunderstandings about scale or confused areas. Unofficial notes are where things get interesting. Let's discuss, and I'll use this map of the Drifting Isles to illustrate. 
all of these notes are written by its author, Cornelius de Mar, in the first person, but they do contain these three kinds of unofficial notes. The wider scale notes that you'll find on any map are the expository notes. A lot of the time, these can be official notes written in the legend or in a specific text box. That's what I do for a fair number of my maps if you watched my other videos. But these can give context to some of the details that are too general for a member of the public to just randomly spout out in conversation. For instance, in the top of this map, Cornelius writes, I had heard the tales, of course, of the drifting isle. Some claimed that it was an ancient whale-like creature swimming with a forest on its back. Others posited that it was some kind of pumice outcrop, a stone light enough to float. But when my ship stopped at the isle, I remembered the stories that our grandmother used to tell us at night of a creature from the dawn of the world, large enough to swallow a fleet of ships, the Leviathan. Now this contains no small amount of information about the mythological and cultural landscape of the society from which Cornelius hails, and it gives a lot of insight into the Drifting Isles too. This is a naturalist's map, so it will contain more notes than usual on the explanatory side. The notes will go into the strict reality of what one can expect in different areas, talking to different people, dealing with the local flora and fauna. They're handy for the traveller, and writing them on the map is a great place to store things that one may forget. So Cornelius has filled this map with his observations, but for instance, he writes, These kelp fronds may be among the least dangerous flora of the isle, but they do seem ominous, waving in the shallows. I am not certain, but I believe that the hook-like growths are some kind of overpositor. This is not a theory that I wish to test. Insight, direction, and warning in one. That note discusses not only what the appearances of the kelp is, but their level of danger and their location. Now, the notes on this map are all written in the first person, so they all sound like they're a part of the experiential category, and they are, mostly. But experiential notes deal more specifically with the memories and moments rather than simply being first person. A map found at an abandoned campsite may contain the scrawled accounts of a traveller trying to find a buried treasure. They marked each day they spent in a different location, where they went, what they looked for, what they encountered, less general and more specific. In this case, there's quite a few experiential notes, but the most is probably down the bottom. My brother has headed ashore to speak with the inhabitant of that lone hut on the rock. I have stayed with the ship to sketch this weird place, but the more I do, the more weirdness is revealed to me. All right, we're finishing up now, and you can see the final version of the map is coming together here. Now, I do have a few notes for how it turned out. As always, I gave myself less than eight hours to finish it all, and I ran out of time. I think that it would be improved by cramming every available space with notes, and I may in my own time, but overall, I'm very happy with how it turned out. What do you think of the map? I'd be keen to hear whether you would find this to be a useful world building and immersion tool. I'll be giving it to my players in game to help them learn more about the Drifting Isle and the Leviathan. As always, the full A2 version of this map is available on my journal. The link is in the description below. Thank you to all of my supporters. If you want me to talk more about my specific points or if you have questions, please feel free to comment them below. I try to reply to every question. Good luck, adventurers, and I'll see you next week.